Hello everybody and welcome. I uh, hope you can hear me. Yeah, it looks like I have audio. That's one of the things that always goes off on me. <laughs> it looks like we've got a few people here already. Uh, what do we got? 16 people. So welcome everyone. And let's get started. Um, today the subject is going to be uh, prehistoric pot or the history of, of coil pottery here in the southwest. Uh, and with that a little bit of an emphasis on southeast Arizona, southwest New Mexico just because that's where I live. Um, but overall, just coil pottery in the Southwest. And um, <clears throat> that doesn't have to be the nature of your questions. If you have questions about coil pottery or wild clay or, uh, you know, natural mineral pigments for painting your pottery or, or outdoor firings or anything, that's all good. Just shoot your questions up there in the chat and I'll get them answered. <clears throat> but I've got a lot of pictures to show you today, a lot of slides of uh, prehistoric pottery we can talk about. Uh, the evolution basically of pottery here in the southwest over the years and and uh, maybe look at some pictures get some inspiration so uh should be good should be a good time uh, we got people here from all over got somebody from australia nom is here from australia and um just all over the place central california clarice uh indigenous pothead i think that's jim hello jim how are you hey Oops, my chat was too long. Um, I didn't see your chat at all, Chuck. Did it just not go through because it was so long? Must have. Anyways, uh, so yeah, so I've got a lot of stuff to show you today, and hopefully, um, you know, we'll we'll get through some stuff and, and have some good questions, and hopefully, you know, the questions are things that we can all benefit from, learn from. So uh, don't be afraid to shoot your questions out there, no matter if you think it's stupid or whatever, because uh, there's people in the... Uh, there's people here on the live stream from all different sorts of um, experience levels, right? Some people are just starting out and they might want to know, uh, you know, how much temper to add to your clay. And some people are more advanced and they might, you know, want to know about uh, fixatives in uh, paint, you know. So whatever your question, it's, it's not too stupid or too advanced. It, you know, shoot it out there and uh, the whole group can then benefit from your question. So uh, it's good to see everybody here. I'm still looking at a good time for live streams, trying different days, different times. So... Uh, Sunday morning was just an idea. I looked on my, I can look in the analytics, the YouTube analytics, and it shows me that a lot of my viewers are online on Sunday mornings. And with the current temperature, June's a really, really hot month here in Tucson. And so, you know, it's 100 plus degrees every day. Uh, mornings are good to be in the studio because my studio is, is a porch, right? So if I turn on the other cam, you can see the, the light coming from outside there. Because my studio is a porch, you know, there's no cooling out here, so it gets really hot. And so uh, mornings are good because it's the coolest part of the day. I thought about putting a fan out here, but uh, fan, a fan wouldn't work so good because, first of all, if I'm making pottery, uh, the fan's going to dry that pottery really fast. And second, if I'm filming video, it's just going to make a lot of noise. So I think um, I've been making pottery and that kind of thing in my office. I just have this little rolling uh, workbench that I put in my office and, and do that. But for the live streams, I think this is a better place to do it because I've got all my materials behind me. If you have any questions about different materials or clays or, or pots, I can grab an example really easy. So it is a good place for that. Oh, what do we got here? Let me look at the chat. Um, Charlene, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Charlene Thomas is making her own oven. How high should the floor be above the fire to put bowls on without being in the fire? Um, yeah, it just, it just depends on how big your firebox is, right? So you have to have... A firebox large enough that you can put enough fuel in there mine is maybe a foot is maybe no more than 15 inches high right a little over a foot probably so the size of your firebox determines how high your pottery shelf is so the, the pottery shelf needs to be just above the firebox as close as you can get that it's not getting you know the pottery's not getting whacked when you shove wood in uh, welcome from North Carolina plan on using old trash can cover for top should I make a slab I don't understand what you'd use a slab for, uh, Char is it Charlene? Uh, I don't know what you'd use a slab for, um, trash can cover. You don't want to cover it up. You want to let that air come out, I think. So uh, I think what you want is something with a hole in it uh, so it can continue to vent. Um, I think if you look at my example, um, some of my, my kiln firing videos, uh, for example, uh, the one where I um, fired the Holy Grail. Did you see the one where I made the Indiana Jones Holy Grail? Uh, or... The one where I um, where I made the mugs. Uh, these were both this year, I think January, February. Uh, look at those. Look how I built that kind of um, a chimney on top with bricks. Because uh, what you really want is dr is more draw. If you just cover it up, uh, the pots are going to get dark and sooty in there. It's not really going to not going to get the best heat by covering it up. 
Uh, Chris in Kansas, hey, good to see you here. Um, Pedro Toledo says, cool channel. Thanks, Pedro, I appreciate that. Uh, Mark Gibson, do you have any red clay that fires white? I've heard it. Um, are you talking to me, Mark? Do I have red clay that fires white? No, I don't. I've never. I don't think that's possible, Mark. Um, generally, white clay fires. It, first of all, it's hard to know by looking at clay in the wild what color it's going to fire. But generally, if a clay that you're digging out of the ground is red, it's because it has iron in it. And for a clay to fire white, it has to have no iron in it. So I, I don't know if that's possible. A lot of times a gray clay will fire white. Even a black clay or a brownish clay can fire white, but a red clay generally, I don't think can fire white. I, there is black clay they have up at Zuni. It's like black as midnight uh, and, and it fires white as snow. Um, so there can be surprises, but I don't, I don't think it's possible for a red clay to fire white. I could be wrong, you know. Uh, Jonathan, I have a charcoal oven like you showed some weeks ago in England. Cool, uh, you, do you use it to fire pottery, Jonathan? Uh, indigenous probably sunny in Arizona. Yeah. Uh, well, see, our, our weather is pretty predictable usually. So uh, May, June is hot and dry, and our rains will start in July. So July, August, and into September, we'll be getting our monsoon season. You might think it'd be hot and dry here, but it's actually, um, it's actually rainy, and it cools off a little bit, which is why June is actually our hottest month. Uh, cool shirt. Thank you. I uh, ordered it on Amazon. How long should a pot stay in the charcoal oven once it reaches the right temperature? No. None. As far from my experience, if you run that temperature up in that kiln uh, to the temperature you want, uh, then you just let it cool off, and as soon as it's cool enough to touch, pull it out. It it doesn't have to sit there for a certain period of time. The thing is, uh, of the methods of heat transfer, that's the way heat moves around inside of a kiln, right? Conduction is the most efficient. So if the if your if your pot walls are relatively thin, now if you've got half inch thick walls, I mean it's going to take a while for that heat to get in there, right? But if you've got quarter inch thick pot walls. And the outside is 1,000 degrees Celsius. I'm just picking a number, right? How long does it take for the middle to get to be 1,000 degrees Celsius? Not very long, right? Like like 30 seconds maybe, right? So uh, conduction, it's just moving through a solid object like that. You just want to make sure it's that temperature all the way through. Once it reaches that temperature, you're good. It's just a matter of letting it cool off. Um, uh, is Ella my story my way? Hello. Hello, is Ella. Uh, indigenous pot had my... We have red clay fire a light pink, but never white. Yeah, I don't know if that's possible. Uh, off conversation, I like your shirt. <laughs> Thank you, Zell. Uh, somebody's already said that. I ordered it off Amazon. Uh, yes, I have once very successful. Uh, okay, cool, Jonathan. That's awesome. Uh, I'd love to see a picture of that. If you could send it to me sometime, that'd be, that'd be really cool. Because I bet it's a little different configuration than mine. Um, okay, let's get into the content then, why don't we? Uh, we can look at some of these pics. So... Um, this is partly based on um, a presentation I did a few months ago for Cochise College, but that was specifically about Southeast Arizona. So this is kind of a broader subject. It's the entire Southwest, but kind of more of a, a little bit more focused on Southeast Arizona. And that's just because that's, that's the history I know best, right? Because um, I travel around the Southwest. I make potters from different places sometimes, but I live in Southeast Arizona. And so Southeast Arizona and Southwest New Mexico is kind of my area, of, um, you know, where I know more. I'm kind of the expert there. If I move to the Four Corners area, you know, I might not consider myself an expert on it. I know, I probably know more than most people here. So, uh, early ceramics, and I have this listed as 200 to 700 AD. Uh, there's literally, uh, there's ceramics that are <clears throat> from about, you know, the year 1 AD, from, you know, early on, a couple hundred years before that. But mostly they're not pots. They're like little figurines and stuff. So around 200 is about the earliest actual pots uh, that we find here in the Southwest. So the pot I have pictured on the screen here, uh, you can see this, it's on display down at the Arizona State Museum on the University of Arizona campus here in Tucson. And I believe um, that this is the oldest pot they have in their collection. This came from an early agricultural period site here in the Tucson area, uh, which is actually where some of the earliest pottery in the Southwest that has been found by archeologists came from, is right here in, in Tucson. So this is one of those early pots from, you know, roughly 200 AD. And at that time, they were what you call a seed jar. That is, it doesn't really have a neck. It just kind of comes up to a hole, uh, kind of round, kind of globular. And then they could put like a bowl or something over the top and kind of close it off. And they think that what was motivating them to make pottery at this time was, um, uh, you know, they were starting to settle down and become agricultural people. And they were trying to keep vermin out of their grain, right? So in a ceramic jar like this, in a basket, 
a rat can chew through, a mouse can chew through this basket. But in ceramic, you know, it's it's sealed. Bugs can't get in, mice can't get in. You put a jar on top, a bowl on top and seal it, it keeps uh, vermin out. So that's what they think the motivation was for starting to make ceramics. And this, like I said, was 200 AD. And so between about two and seven, so that's that's a pretty broad period of time, right? I mean, that's like 500 years. That's a long time. Uh, they were just making planeware. And it, and it evolved into different shapes of planeware, but they really weren't decorating their pottery very much during this time. Uh, so this is another example. This is a picture that I got off the internet of one of those early agricultural period uh, seed jars, excuse me, that, that they're... They're excavating, so the archaeologists are in the process of digging it out, and it's it's just partially exposed. But it's that seam form, that kind of rounded form, no neck, all right? Uh, the other thing that happened around this time, uh, not only do we have uh, ceramics start to appear and, and increase across the southwest during this two to 700 A.D. period, is you have this uh, sharp divide between technologies, the way pots are made. So everything in the western southwest, that is from about you know, roughly Tucson and west, right, into western Arizona, California, uh, you know, so we have the paddle and anvil method, which if you've seen the way Tony Soares makes pottery, Tony Soares has a, a channel here on here on YouTube, you can check him out, uh, I'll put the link in the doobly-doo later after after the live stream, um, and I made a video about Tony about, about a year ago, I think it was last June, uh, showing how he makes pottery using the paddle and anvil method. And a lot of the local uh, native potters here in the Tucson area, uh, they're O'odham potters. Uh, and I'm, I'm probably ruining the pronunciation of that. I'm terrible at that. Anyways, uh, they all use paddle and anvil traditionally here. And up in the Phoenix area, uh, like Ron Carlos, a uh, well-known Maricopa potter, uh, they all use paddle and anvil as well. But um, if from prehistoric times, if you go... Anywhere more than about maybe 50 miles, 60 miles east of here, it's all coil and scrape. So uh, the San Pedro Valley, which is the next valley to the east of me here, uh, where I grew up in Sierra Vista, is on the San Pedro Valley. And on the San Pedro Valley, that's kind of the boundary line between paddle and anvil and coil and scrape. So uh, some of that, like dragoon red on brown that's made there, about half of it is paddle and anvil and half is coil and scrape. That's that cultural dividing line. So... Somehow, the technology for how pottery is made, maybe it came from two different sources. And so, in one part, they learned to make paddle and anvil. And I think people, by nature, are pretty conservative. And, and certainly, uh, a lot of native cultures are very conservative, right? This is the way our people do it. This is the way I learned to do it from my grandmother, and I'm going to keep doing it in the way that our family makes pottery. So, people that learned paddle and anvil will tend to continue making paddle and anvil. People that learned making coil and scrape will tend to, even though they might have lived on that boundary and they might have had neighbors who did it the other way, or they might have traveled and, and seen people making it that way, they were very unlikely to change. They, they stayed with the way that they did it, or their family did it, or their people did it. So, uh, And the interesting thing about this, this technological divide to me is we see it from early early ceramics, when ceramics first came into the Southwest, and then it carried through all the way clear into the historic period, clear into the time that the Spanish and, and the Americans first started showing up and all these things, uh, we still see that dividing line pretty much right where it is on this map, uh, where everything west of the San Pedro Valley is uh, paddle and anvil. Everything east of the San Pedro Valley is coil and scrape. And so it, it's, it's fascinating to me, uh, that line and how it stayed in place all those years. Uh, let me look at the um, <clears throat> let me look at the chat really quick. See if I missed anything. Uh, uh, my fairy treasures just did her first open pit fire. Oh, she, uh, that's she's on my um, uh, the ancient potters club. So um, that's uh, a Angela, I believe. That's great. Uh, and there's uh, Lanite Dave. Hey Andy, I'm late to get started. Do you plan on using? Your brick kiln this summer during the fire restrictions. Yeah, in fact, um, Dave, I'm I'm working on, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm working on making pot, a bunch of pottery right now. So I want to do, in the past, if you've seen the the videos where I fire pottery in my kiln, I'm doing like one pot or two pots at a time. And so my idea is to get kind of what you might call a kiln load. I want to get like maybe ten or twelve pots all at once uh, to fire in there, which I haven't done yet. And then I'm going to make a video kind of showing because the way I fired has evolved quite a bit. 
showing the way I'm firing now and kind of go through that process. So if you look at the, um, the Holy Grail video from January and that mug video, which I think might have been December, but it was right in that December, January era. Um, look at how I was firing those and you know, it, it has changed quite a bit with the ad hoc chimney and everything. So it, I'd love to do that, Dave. And it, and it is on my agenda. Um, Clarice, uh, I'm a modern potter of today in my area. My ancestors were basket weaver. No pottery was made. I'm finding all this interesting. Uh, so yeah, a lot of, um, Clarice, a lot of people, uh, native people here in, in the United States or, you know, in North America, uh, not all of them made pottery. So I get, I get questions from people up in the Pacific Northwest quite a bit saying, oh, how did the people here make pottery? And I say, well, I don't think they made pottery. You know, not, it didn't work with everybody's lifestyle, first of all. Some people were very nomadic and, and pottery was hard to kind of transport around because it's fragile. Uh, some people just didn't live where maybe there was good clay or maybe the technology just didn't reach them. So, uh, but it's all interesting. It's all good. Uh, what's the best reversible or archival glue for pottery? Hey, Wild Smooth, uh, I do not know the answer to that. I, I don't restore pottery. Um, there's a guy, um, I'm terrible with names. There's a guy here on YouTube who does some, who did a good restoration of a Pinedale black on white jar. You might just like do a YouTube search for Pinedale black on white jar. I can't think of his name to save my life right now. Uh, and he had a lot of good information on, on restoring old pots, but I don't know anything about it. Um, Oh, what was used as grog in the Mesa Verde region? Uh, West End says what was used as grog in the Mesa Verde region. I believe most of their grog was grog. Well, you know, what you mean, uh, West End, is what did they use for temper, right? Because temper is any non-plastic material in your clay. Grog is specifically ground up ceramics, right? Uh, and, I, and that's, I believe, what traditionally they had used mostly was, was uh, what they call um, shirred temper. Archaeologists call it shirred temper. Uh, a potter might call it grog. So sure, temper. They were taking broken pieces of pottery, grinding them up into a powder, and using that as their temper. Um, and and I, you may find some sand temper up there as well. I'm not a, I'm not like I said. I'm not an expert on uh, the Mesa Verde region. Uh, Adam, my son Archer wants to know if there are things that work to color clay or slip different colors. We're in the Prescott area. If you know of any good clay sources up here, um, yeah, Adam, I I don't. Um, I had a good friend uh, who studied pottery and used to teach pottery up in Prescott at the um, Smoky, is it Smoke Eye, Smoky Museum there? And uh, I think they've changed the name since then, but that's what it used to be called. And, and, uh, and he was an expert and he knew a lot of the clay sources in the Prescott area, but he just passed away recently. Tom Weiss was his name. Uh, so there may be some people there at that museum who learn from Tom and may be able to help you on clay sources and that sort of thing. Uh, as far as coloring clay, uh, you don't, well, at least traditionally, you wouldn't color the clay itself, the clay you're building the pot from. You would slip it because it would take a lot more pigment to color the clay, you know, that we're making the pot out of than to just add a thin layer of slip, like paint, on the outside of the pot. So generally what you do is you build the pot out of your brown or your gray clay, your, your boring clay colors that you have, and then you would, um, you would put a thin slip of a color like a yellow or white or red or something that's more interesting over the top. And so what you need to do then is find yourself a good clay that has working properties. Don't worry about the color. You know, probably in the Prescott area, it's going to be brown, right? And then, uh, and then go out and find yourself a good white or red uh, clay that you can use as a slip. Now, if you're willing to travel in Arizona, uh, this was Adam, right? Uh, if you're willing to travel in Arizona, uh, take, take my, uh, if you go on my website, my, my website is ancientpottery.how, not .com, it's .how, ancientpottery.how. I have um, uh, I have a um, a class uh, all about uh, paint slips pigments uh, and, and it, that'll teach you everything you need to know. But more than that, uh, it it has a map in there of different uh, pigment sources that you can access. So if, if you go in there and take that class, uh, you'll get access to a map of pigment sources. A lot of them in Arizona. They're, they're not going to be in the Prescott area, but you know. If you drive, uh, say, over to um, the Mogollon Rim, maybe, you know, uh, I'll have stuff that you can get in that area or even down in the Phoenix area and stuff. So there, there, is, some, there is some pigment sources and some slips that, that you can access if you're willing to drive a couple hours. Uh, so it might be worth your time, Adam. Um, West End Temper. Yeah, so, so Temper is just a, a broader category, right? So Grog is just ground-up ceramics and Temper is anything that's non-plastic. Yeah, 
Uh, Clarice, if you were in, if there were, if they were in a place for a while, they would make mortars straight out of large granite surface. They might mostly uh, grind acorns in. Yeah, you see those a lot around here. Those what they call bedrock mortars. So if it's built right into like a solid piece of granite, um, but a lot of them are portable too. They're you know they're built into a rock that they can pick up and carry with them too. Only clay we're finding is brown red, which is why he asked. Thanks for that. Yeah, there is some brown clay. Um, there is brown clay in the in the Prescott area. I know, uh, like I said, my friend Tom used to teach classes at that Smoky Museum, and they would go out and harvest clay and the whole thing. So uh, I would start by asking over there. I really don't know what else to tell you about that area. Again, though, Adam, if you're if you're uh, if you take my uh, Wild Clay 101 class, there is a map in there that will take you to, uh, you know clay sources all over the southwest unfortunately i don't i don't think i have any in the prescott area but if you're willing to drive i can help you out a little more um how coarse is the temper you use in your pieces uh so indigenous potheads wants to know how coarse my temper is uh i just use a window screen type screen generally um i just pass it through a screen um sometimes um i have some screens i ordered off off amazon and i can put the link uh in the doobly do after after we're done with the live stream um i order i got some screens that are um for honey they sell them for screening the junk out of honey and uh, and they work really good they're metal uh, so they last and and i and you can order different screens go on amazon they sell them that fit right on five gallon buckets and all kinds of things uh so just a window screen is fine you can go finer um you know the finer your temper uh the finer detail you're able to do with your pottery so um you know it, it you can you can screen it fine it's just you may have to work harder at you know collecting it uh and so it, you know, think about that. But, you know, like when I made that sugar bowl, if you see that video where I made the sugar bowl, that lip on the inside that, that holds the lid in, uh, that was really complicated because my clay was, my temper was coarse. If I'd had finer temper, I could have done better things with that. That's why, like, if you go up to New Mexico, a lot of the, uh, the native potters up there will use um, uh, volcanic ash because that's a really great, super fine temper. And if you're looking for a really, really fine temper like that, that's available to everybody, uh, diatomaceous earth you can buy it at any hardware store makes a great temper and it's super fine um, can salt be used as temper no you do not want salt in your pottery uh, any salt you put in your clay is going to dissolve because that's what clay does or that's what salt does when it gets wet so it, it will not act as temper no uh, I made it high uh, Ren Pixie hey you're here good to see you uh, how are you? I am a new fan. Mosin Joma. Hey, Mos, Mos, I'm probably ruining your name. I apologize. Mosin Joma. It's good to see you here. I appreciate all my new fans. Uh, Charlene, the local clay I have access to is a mixture of red with a little streaks of white and yellow. Do you need, no, no, you just mix it all together. A lot of clays are like that. They'll have different kinds together. You just, once you knead it all up, it's all going to be good. Um, can you use charcoal in the Chimney. Of, yeah, I never have, but uh, a lot of people have asked about that using charcoal in that in my kiln, in my little brick kiln. So it's definitely something I want to try at some point. But I never have tried charcoal, and I'm sure it would work. You know, it's just going to burn slower. I just sit there and feed wood in the whole time. But the charcoal would last a little better. I watched a guy at the university put a pot back together using type type bond three. Yeah, I don't know anything about putting them together. Um, can you give my dad a shout out? Questions we all have. Um, his name's Steven, and he's absolutely in awe of your channel and work. Hey, Steven, uh, your son said I should say hi to you, so I hope you're watching. <laughs> you have a video on how to test new clay sources. Oh, uh, yeah, I do. Um, uh, you'll have to go to my channel. Just go to my, it's go to my page, my YouTube page, and, and there's a search box there, and you can search for, like, uh, testing clay or something you know it, it's there i made it last summer so it's not that old there is one it's all about finding new clay and what you test for and how to test and what to look for so check that out um salt melts yeah no kidding and you don't want salt in your pot if you t if you select if you grab a clay from the wild and it's salty to the taste uh you either have to try to wash that salt out or throw it out it, you don't want salt in your clay um he's watching okay good well i'm glad steven got to see that <laughs> Uh, I'm experimenting using pumice as temper. Yeah, no, that looks good. And I saw your video on that. Mark Gibson has a video on using pumice. Pumice, you know, uh, when I went up to John Olson's house last summer, I have a video on that last June, if you look that up, uh, and he's making corrugated pottery. Uh, he was using uh, those red uh, cinders, those volcanic cinders, um, and, and they were just, he just ground them nice and fine and just mixed them in with this clay. And that's pretty much the same as pumice, you know. That's good because it's going to be, um, not only is it going to have sharp edges, so it's going to work good as temper, 
Um, but but it's it's going to be inert in the firing. You're not going to heat it up and it's going to pop or expand or anything because you know it comes from fire, right? <clears throat> I'm loving my volcanic ash temper, but still haven't quite worked out the ideal percentage to use for my clay. Yeah, it's just a matter of practice, Dave. Uh, Training troll says cool shirt. Thank you very much. Uh, I really want to make wood ash clay. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't think that's really a thing. Uh, indigenous project. Somebody just, uh, maybe it was you that said that recently, that you'd seen a video with that. I, I really don't think wood ash is going to make it cl I don't. I could be totally wrong. I've seen mountains of wood ash outside of like old um, uh, places where they burned a lot of wood, like an old smelt, old wood smelter or something. It'd be mountains of ash. And, and it gets slick and, you know, and snotty when it's wet like clay. But I don't. I don't think you can make pottery out of that. I, I'm pretty sure you can. But hey, you know, prove me wrong. I'm good. Uh, West End, there's a YouTube video about pottery restoration, uh, Japanese master. Gold processing classifiers work well for screening clay. Yeah, I have one of those. Hey, Duncan, uh, I've got one of those for gold panning. My son got a bunch of stuff. Uh, he was helping a, a person that did prospecting move, and they gave him a bunch of these really nice screens. So uh, those are cool. Um, all right, what if we put in too much sand, says Mosin? Uh you know, your, your clay is going to lose plasticity if you put too much temper in it. So what you'll want to do is add some more clay back in to try to even that out. You'll find it. You'll find that edge. When you add enough, you'll, without any temper, it'll probably be really sticky. You add enough temper and the clay has a nice texture. You add too much temper, you know, it's, it gets short where you, you bend it and it cracks instead of bending, right? Let me get back to my presentation. We have a lot of ground to cover here. So we were talking about coil and scrape versus uh, paddle and anvil technology. Uh, so 200 to 700, uh, we just have a lot of plane wares. And, and, and these different groups, so like Ancestral Puebloan or Anazazi potters up in northern Arizona, they're making grayware pottery. They're famous for their grayware pottery, right, at this time. But, but that wasn't like they were going out to select gray clay. Mostly it's because most of their clay up on the Colorado Plateau is gray clay, or the best clays are. So they were using what they had. And down in the deserts near Phoenix and Tucson, they were making, you know, uh, brown or buffware clay and pottery. And that's just because that's what they had available in those areas. And the Mogollon up in the mountains, they were making more brown and redware clay just because that's what the clays in those areas looked like. So although these cultures are kind of associated with certain colors of clay, it's not so much traditional to use red or brownware clay if you're a Mogollon potter. It's really like that's what they would have had access to in their area. Uh, let's see. Move the, oh my, let's see. So here, uh, after about uh, 700, 7 to 1200, uh, they start making decorated pottery. And, and again, it's based on what's available in their area. But all of these groups that had been making plainware pottery for the last 500 years uh, suddenly discovered hey, you know, we can make this pottery a lot prettier if we paint some designs on it. And so, uh, again, these different cultures are famous for their decorations. The Mogion are famous for red on brown. The Holcom are famous for red on buff. The, the uh, Anazazi or Ancestral Puebloan are famous for black on white. But that's just a lot of that is... I mean, some of its traditions are forming. Traditions are forming. But those traditions were built on top of what was, you know, available in their area as well. Uh, so here's an example of a dragoon red on brown bowl. This is this is pretty typical of what we find in in Meyer, where I'm from, over on the San Pedro River, red on brown from that era, uh, and uh, and I'll talk about why uh, that's the case, right? So why why red on brown? Because uh, brown clay, uh, the picture on the left there, brown clay is ubiquitous in that area, right? You can't go anywhere and not find brown clay. Now, if you're looking for some clay that's not brown, let's say you wanted some gray clay, like the Anazazis were using. You'd be hard pressed to find any gray clay in the San Pedro Valley, right? Now you wanted white clay, forget it, right? There's no white clay. Um, you, even buff clay is extremely hard to come by up there. Brown clay we have everywhere. So they were making red and brown because every village had brown clay within a short walk, right? And the same with the red. This is an example of, um, of a source of, um, uh, oh, I can't say it, ochre, red ochre, uh, that's in the San Pedro Valley. So the top picture, is where I'm digging it out of the hillside. And then the bottom picture is me showing you breaking a little piece open, how red that is inside. So it's just red ochre or, or red iron oxides like hematite are super common up there. You can, almost any village would have it within a day's walk of that village. And if not, 
you know, their neighboring village had it. They could trade for it. So uh, the reason that these cultures like Ho'okam were making red on buff was that that was what they had available, right? Um, people used what was local. Later on, as they continued to make red on brown or red on buff or whatever, uh, as they continued over the course of years, then it became a tradition. Then they would move somewhere and they would search out these materials. But it started out, it was just uh, it was just what they had. And that's where a lot of you are, right? You're starting with, to make pottery. You're going out to find clay and you're like, oh, all I can find in my area is brown clay. All I can find in my area is gray clay. Well, it has to do with the, you know, the geology of where you live. So uh, it's, that's how it worked. That's how it worked in those days. Uh, until they get really into pottery and they start trading for it, you know, you've got to really want that material to trade for it because it takes a lot of resources to bring things in by trade. You're probably paying a lot for it, you know, in their terms. They didn't have money, but uh, they were paying a lot, whatever they were paying. Uh, it was costly to acquire those more expensive slips and minerals that they used to make the fancier pottery that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So here's an example, another example of the Dragoon red on brown uh, pot. Uh, pretty typical, just local materials. This is what they were using. That red iron oxide paint and a brown body clay. Easy peasy. And the same was going on in the Hohokam region, red on buff. Now the interesting thing about the red on buff is uh, the archaeologists are able to look at those sherds, figure out that most of that uh, Hohokam pottery was being made in one area near this one village, huge village called Snake Town. So like 90% of that red and buff pottery was being produced right there and shipped all over the place, which is pretty cool. I don't know of another example like that where it was so localized in the Southwest. Uh, more red on buff Hohokam pottery here. And there's another example with some dancers. Uh, so let me, um, let me go back to the, uh, to the chat, see if I'm missing anything. Uh, my fairy treasures. What? When I did my first firing yesterday, I wrapped my pottery in banana orange salt. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's that's kind of a different sort of uh, firing than I'm talking about here. Uh, my fairy treasures. That's that's more like your traditional uh, studio pottery pit fire, and they do all kinds of like uh, copper carbonate and and um, like I said, seaweed and banana peels. But uh, that's not it's not really traditional. That's just you know it's it's different. It's different than what I do. Um, well, it is just off topic, but have you ever found gold in your clay? No, I never have. Um, now, now pyrite, uh, pyrite is what they call fool's gold. Um, there's some, there's some washes here in Tucson that if I collect temper out of them, I'll get pyrite in my clay and you don't want that because, uh, at a certain temperature that pyrite will off gas sulfur and it'll create pops. So, uh, you don't want that. I don't know about gold. Pumice temper makes your pottery very plastic. Um, yeah, Okay. Uh, Clarice, I have a lake nearby with water sources so low. Uh, yeah, yeah, bottom of a lake might be good clay. And it might also be that clay that's so full of organic matter that when you mix it up, it stinks like a sewer. So be careful of that. Um, Kyle Bird, what were the heavily decorated pots used for back then? Surely not cooking. Yeah, um, no, they weren't all ceremonial, which, you know, that's kind of a running joke, isn't it? Um, everything that's decorated is ceremonial. Um, but but they were used for uh, eating out of or storing things in or even uh, carrying water and those kind of things. I mean, obviously, this bowl wasn't used for carrying water, but uh, they weren't unused. They weren't just ceremonial. They were actually used in everyday life. Um, now, you can tell a cooking pot when you find it. I was just at an archaeological dig last weekend. I went up to uh, Cliff, New Mexico, to the archaeology field school to teach pottery to the archaeology students. And... Um, we went out to the ruin and walked around. They just started excavating, I think, the day before we got there. So there was all this material they dug out of the ruin and, and put up on, like, tarps or uh, plastic uh, that they were, you know, going to go through later. And there were there were pieces of shirt in there that were covered in soot, you know, just black and, and you know, covered in, in charcoal, basically, you know, char. And so the cooking pots are obvious. The cooking pots are blackened from being over fires. So these aren't cooking pots, but they were used in everyday life, eating... Uh, you know, uh, serving food, those kind of things. Uh, so let's move along. Um, uh, Membris. So Membris is over uh, farther west or farther east from Hohokam. It's over in New Mexico. And they uh, and they also had, a, a at the same time, they were all making these bichrome pottery, one color of paint, right? Uh, but this is a little more advanced because there's a slip 
So there's a body clay that's gray. There's a white slip, and then there's this red iron oxide that is painted on, and then it's reduced. So they're turning that red. It's red paint when they apply it, and then it's fired in such a way that it turns black. I just did a video on this um, last week, last Wednesday. So if you're interested in that reduction process, check that out. Uh, and so they did all kinds of amazing, amazing paintings. Here's some turkeys eating a uh, centipede or something like that. And some of these are like scenes from mythology or something that are just completely wacky. I mean, you could study this one for a long time and not figure out what it means, but it is interesting. Uh, and, you know, and, and lots of people, people, animals, birds, fish, so uh, just fascinating stuff. Uh, literally a window into their world, uh, members' pottery. Uh, and then, you know, we find in archaeological context sometimes the tools and materials they were using. So on the left here, uh, there's a gourd, that's a gourd scraper, just like I use or a lot of uh, potters use these days. And this was found in a cave, so it didn't rot. Uh, a gourd scraper uh, that they were using to make pottery. And then uh, above that are uh, yucca brushes that they were using to paint their pottery. So uh, we can get some good ideas of the kind of materials they were using uh, found in caves. And then, of course, the one on the top is, the, is a puki. It's a perforated plate that was found intact. And on the bottom, uh, these are loaves of hematite. So these are this is how that hematite was. Um, they were literally like processing that material and then and then shipping it i talked about you know how costly it would be to to acquire the goods to make fancy pottery if you didn't have them locally and this is how that hematite was shipped around it was made into loaves so then a trader could come through he could have a backpack full of these hematite loaves and just trade them off i don't know what he was trading them for but um and here's some more um prehistoric pottery tools now this is the paddle and anvil method so that's actually a prehistoric paddle and some prehistoric stone anvils and some polishing stones. So we find these things in archaeological context. That's how we can know how they were making pottery in those days. And then if you go north up into ancestral Puebloan country, you get a lot of black on white. So this is a, a cibola. This is a mineral black on white. Uh, if you go up to the Mesa Verde country, they were using organic paint black on white. But down south uh, in cibola region, that's, that's around Zuni, Acoma, uh, then they were using uh, mineral paints. Uh, and this is another, um, like a Tularosa black on white from up in that area. And uh, they weren't just doing black on white, they were doing black on red as well. But everything was kind of bichrome at that time, two colors, maybe a slip color and some paint or just the body clay and paint. It wasn't until about 1200 uh, that polychrome started to be made. And so 1200 to 1450 was really when things started going crazy in the world of pottery and a lot of polychromes were being made. Um, I'm going to go back and check the, um, I'll go back and check the uh, uh, chats here, make sure I've missed anything. Hello from the Mud Wizard Studio in Texas. Had to drop in and saw the post on social. Hey there, CJS1990C. Glad you could join us. Message is held for review, huh? Hmm, what did you do, indigenous pothead? I don't know how to do this. Oh, I clicked review and it went away. I'm sorry. Uh, it could have had a link in it or something or a word it didn't like. I don't know what was going on with that. Um, uh, Duncan, indigenous pothead, we dig down through the sand to the clay layer in the wash we gold prospect in. That's cool. Uh, Chris Dawson, amazing. I have nice glaze brushes and still cannot decorate. It's beautiful as they, oh yeah, they did amazing work with those yucca brushes. There's no doubt, no doubt. Uh, so let's go back to the uh, thing. So let's see. Uh, they started making polychromes. And um, and again, oh, let, me, let me turn this off. I've got a photo behind here that's covering it up. Okay. So again, based on those traditions that I talked about, they, they started making like brownware pottery in the, you know, Mogollon country or buffware pottery in, in uh, the whole calm area. Those, the, as they started making more polychrome, those were kind of based on what their traditions were. So you know, if they had a tradition for redware, they might continue to make redware, but add some paint to it, some decoration. Or that if up north they were making black on white pottery, they might build on that and add like some red to it or something, but it's still predominantly black on white because those were the traditions that they had grown up with. At this point, they'd been making pottery for, you know, a thousand years in the Southwest. They had long traditions of uh, black on white or, or buffware pottery that they were building on. So. Polychrome comes around and, and everybody wants to get on the polychrome bandwagon because, you know, it's beautiful stuff. It probably had trade value. 
Um, and so uh, materials become harder to get. The materials are not always easily available for um, polychromes because you need two or three different uh, pigments, right? You might have colored slips and, and different mineral pigments and stuff. And, and so they may not all be in range of your village where you could hike out and grab it. So you're more and more dependent on that trader coming through and trading for stuff. You're more and more part of like, um, you know, an economy where stuff comes in from far away that you have to grow something locally that you can trade for it, kind of like, you know, how we are today. So uh, life is becoming a little more um, complex. Uh, the picture on the left is collecting that white clay slip up on the Mogion rim that I use. Uh, the picture on the top is actually a manganese that I collect over in southwest New Mexico at some old manganese mines. And then the picture on the bottom right is Rocky Mountain bee plant. And that is at Concho Lake up in um, uh, near Concho, Arizona, near Sholo. So um, if you get up, if you live up, you know, like Ren Pixie or some of you, I know there's a few of you that are following me that live up in the Concho area. Uh, I went to Concho Lake last summer and there was, there was Rocky Mountain bee plant everywhere. So that's a great place to find uh, that bee plant if you're looking to make some organic paint. And I'll talk more about organic paint as we move along. Um, Oh, uh, Indigenous Pothead wants to know what the perforations for on the Pookie. Um, yeah, nobody knows, right? So that uh, it was a tradition that developed up in the Cayenta area, so north central Arizona, up near the Utah border. Uh, and then about 1,300, those people left. They moved south, and we can track them by their perforated plates. So all of a sudden, perforated plates start appearing on the Mogollon Rim and then down like the Phoenix to Tucson area. So these people obviously were moving south and bringing that tradition with them. Uh, I don't know. I'm not too sure that there's any reason for perforations. I think maybe it was just a tradition based on something, a story or, or a mythology or religious beliefs or something. I don't, I'm just guessing. But I have, having used them, I, I, I have pookies that I put the holes in. I don't, I don't think it makes a bit of difference in anything. So that's just my opinion. Okay, uh, so... Let's talk about some of these polychrome pots. So this is uh, Casas Grandes. This is the stuff from Northern Chihuahua where they were making these beautiful, so that is the, that kind of buff cream colored body clay. That is not a slip. That is the color of the clay they were using and then uh, applying red and black mineral paint uh, to the outside of those. And they, did, they made a lot of beautiful pottery down there. Uh, and here's another one of those Casas Grandes types. This one has like a, a water serpent, like the horned water serpent on it, which is a mythological character in uh, the southwest a lot of the you'll find it on pueblo pottery from new mexico as well uh and and a lot of these me, uh, men and women pots these people little fat people pots which are really cool uh and then you've got the salado stuff so salado was made here in in southern arizona and this is another interesting one because uh like the casas grandes stuff i was just showing you that has mineral paint so that black paint is like manganese black right manganese copper black mineral paint on this on this Salado stuff, it's organic paint. So it's it's completely different technology. And this has to do with like, uh, came from the north, right? So this was a tradition up in say the Mesa Verde area, early on making organic paint pottery. And then, you know, it came south, this organic paint on oxidized pottery started, you know, maybe uh, 900 AD down on the little Colorado. And then something else happened, those people moved south. Next thing you know, we have this Salado polychrome being made on the Gila River far to the south. So the, it kind of evolved and you can track the movement of peoples or at least ideas across the landscape based on the technology and the pottery. So this is organic paint made out of, um, let me show you an example. Uh, so this is, this is Rocky Mountain bee plant right here. And um, I don't know if I can turn the right camera on. And uh, it, it's hard right now, it's kind of plasticky feeling because it's, um, it's you know, it's dried up. So I just add a little water, mix it up, and it'll rehydrate really fast. And I paint that on my pots. And then when I fire it in the right atmosphere, uh, then I get uh, these black designs like this. So my video next Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, my video shows uh, me making that football shaped pot, which is painted with, well, not bee plant. It's painted with yucca fruit, but it's organic paint. Now I didn't, excuse me, I wasn't able to fire it in that video because uh, it's fire restrictions right now, so I'm, I'm waiting until probably July or August to fire that pot, but you can see how I do that. All righty, running out of time. Um, 
I wonder if they stitched fabric to them so the clay, yeah, I've heard that indigenous pot had said if maybe they put fabric on the inside of those perforated plates and they might have. I've heard um, an archeologist told, gave me that idea one time and it's certainly possible. Another example of that Salado polychrome, uh, this is organic painted pottery. Uh, this is, I believe, Phoenix polychrome, this one. And this is Tonto polychrome, another one of those organic painted Salado polychrome pots. Uh, so that's just a, a little, just a little smattering of, of uh, that. So the other thing that happened uh, late in this period, so like I was saying, the, the, one of the things I want to leave you with today is that evolution of pottery over time, right? So they started out just trying to keep the, just trying to keep the mice out of their corn, right? Just trying to keep the, the vermin out of their grain. And then slowly it evolved. They started making some crude decorations on it in one color. And later on, they, they learn about slips. And then pretty soon they're making polychrome. So as pottery continued to evolve over time, by the time they're making all that um, polychrome, you know, they're, they're, it's pretty elaborate. They're putting a lot of time and effort into this pottery. It probably had a lot of meaning to them, perhaps even, um, you know, religious meaning, um, that they were spending so much time and energy, like I said, just to get the materials they would have to trade for it. They had to, it had to be important to them. So one of the things at this point, when pottery was obviously very important for some reason to them, um, up in the Mogollon Rim, up in northern Arizona, uh, they s developed, for the first time, glaze paint okay this was lead-based glaze so uh, just like you know you might see old pots uh say old american pots that are glazed with a lead glaze uh, this was not all over glaze like that this was decorations that the mineral they were using had lead in it and therefore would melt and so in this picture you can see that there are lines that have melted glassy and there are other lines where it's not quite so glassy but the glassy ones are really shining. You can literally see brush strokes in this paint where it has glazed and went glassy. So this is something that developed there, say in the Sholo area around 1300. It was a new technology. Uh, and over time it spread east, it spread over to Zuni, it spread down to the uh, Rio Grande Valley so that glazed paint, say by 1400, was being made over a large area of the Southwest. This was a new technology that they came up with. Um, now, 14, say about 1400 it started. The Mogollon Rim area was abandoned about uh, between 1380 and 1400. And then like the Gila and Salt River Valleys of Southern Arizona were abandoned by 1450. So in that period between like 1380 and 1450, uh, a broad swath of the Southwest was abandoned. Uh, all the way down to Casas Grandes Chihuahua, uh, from Phoenix to El Paso, Texas, which is a large area. And from the Mexican border to above the Mogollon Rim, it was a vast area that was depopulated by, say, 14, 1450. Uh, and this, this, impacted, this impacted pottery massively. Uh, because like I said, these people had evolved traditions. Those traditions of pottery making were not only important to them, but they were based on materials that they got close to home. Uh, the, the clays they were using the pigments they were using. They knew where those sources were. They were either traveling out to get those or the trader was traveling out to get those and bringing them to their village. Suddenly, these sources were not available to them. So the pottery they made after they moved changed radically. They either, when they moved, they either started making pottery similar to the people where they moved or they stopped making decorated pottery altogether because life was hard for a generation or so while they got settled and moved and everything and maybe Mom didn't have time to put as much effort into her pottery as she had before. And so because she wasn't doing that, she didn't teach that to the young ones. And so they never learned. You know what I mean? The pottery technology changed. And a lot of pottery types were lost at this period in time because the technology wasn't carried on. The materials weren't available. Uh, so that anytime an area is abandoned or people masses of people move, uh, pottery technology is lost. Uh, so the, a lot of the pottery I make... Uh, like the White Mountain Redware and the Salado Polychromes and stuff, these types stopped being made by 1450 and they were never made again until people in the last 50 years took up an interest and tried making those potteries. Uh, so around the time of this abandonment, let's say uh, 1350, 1400, up at the Hopi Mesas. Now the Hopis, they're there today. They're on the edge of that abandoned area. Everything south of them was kind of abandoned. 
But there were also a place where people went to. As they were leaving this area, a lot of people settled in Hopi. And so it was kind of a, a melting pot as people moved in from the south and people moved in from the north and settled among the Hopi. Uh, and one of the things that came out of that region at that time when people were moving in there uh, was uh, uh, coal-fired pottery. So that was one of the uh, new technologies that came about. And so this uh, Jedido yellowware that was created by coal firing pottery uh, was really, really um, amazing and it made this really beautiful yellow pottery. And that was one of those technologies that developed then. Now last summer I made a video with Bobby Silas. He is trying to rediscover, uh, you know, coal firing, I hope he coal firing and making Sityaki polychrome. So if you're interested, you can go check that video out. Uh, just search for Bobby Silas. Uh, this is a prehistoric Sityaki pot. This is not Bobby's. Um, so yeah, that, that's another one of those technologies that happened right around that time. Now, remember I talked about the movement of people, you know, people leaving. It caused destruction and chaos and people lost technologies. This is another example of, of, of something that happened that kind of ruined a lot of people's lives. And that was the when the Spanish arrived. So the Span Coronado came up here in 1540. I have a, a video about Coronado coming out in, uh, I think, two weeks. Uh, it might be three. Uh, two and a half weeks, something like that. Uh, when the court, when the Spanish arrived, uh, they they brought chaos into this Pueblo world, and these people no longer had access to certain things that they had before, or certain villages were abandoned, so people couldn't go out and get the minerals they had been using for paint or something, and so things changed. So this is that glazed paint. Remember, I told you they were, that glazed technology had traveled to the the Rio Grande area of New Mexico. They were making beautiful glazed pottery when the Spanish arrived. But after the Spanish arrived, the glazed pottery starts doing this drippy thing. You see how it's, it's in, the, in the, this pot was fired upside down and that glazed paint dripped and ran towards the, towards the rim everywhere. And it's believed that that is because they stopped using natural like galena for their lead based paint and started using like Spanish lead, like, you know, a musket ball or something, which was easily available at that time and had a really low melting point. But uh, because it was so easy to melt, it, it, it dripped and ran all the time. And so uh, this was the kind of glaze pottery that the Pueblos were making when the Spanish were there. And then at the time of the Pueblo Revolt, that's when they threw the Spanish out of New Mexico for like 12 years. At the time of the Pueblo Revolt, they stopped making glaze paint altogether. So to this day, nobody's really sure how they were doing glaze paint in the Pueblo world because there was that, again, there was that, you know, chaos. There was warfare. They drove the Spanish out, and then things changed. People went together in different villages. Other villages were abandoned. Whole regions were depopulated because they were worried the Spanish were going to come back and, like, kill them. So they all moved someplace, and so that technology was lost, another lost technology because of that, that chaos in the system. And so... Uh, that's the end of my presentation is this this is, in the, is at Pecos National Monument if you ever get a chance to go there uh, that is they have a really great collection of that kind of proto-historic uh, period pottery uh, so let me uh, let me check the um, uh, the chat here and see what we got I asked that those perf oh yeah I already read that I wonder if there's stitch fabric on dip fabric saw that okay perforated proof uh, West End said the perforations could aid in pot removal. It has not been my experience, but uh, I am open to suggestions. Indigenous Pothead says, Andy, uh, you are very knowledgeable. I love listening to you talk about this stuff. I love archaeology, so it's right up my alley. I started studying. Yeah, it, it's fascinating, and there's no end to the digging you can do on this, Jim, uh, as far as uh, you know, archaeological reports and talking to experts and stuff. I'm working right now on getting a, uh, an archaeologist who's a ceramics analyst, so what she does is she looks at these prehistoric shirts under a microscope and does studies on them to figure out like where they were made or when they were made, all kinds of things. I'm working on maybe getting her to come do a live stream with me so that we can ask her questions and find out about what she does and, and how she does it. I think it would be interesting. Um, U.S. government would destroy the Native American houses every time they attacked them. So much more would be here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, Deb says, you know, that they were destroying the Indians' houses, but that's that's just one that's just one small example like I said the Spanish came they caused chaos you know they drove the Spanish the the Mexican Revolution they they won and they kicked the Spanish out and then they kicked out all the all the priests these priests these Jesuit priests some of these guys had been at these missions not not the same individual priests but there had been Jesuit missionaries at some of these villages these native villages 
for hundreds of years at this point. And they were, um, uh, I mean, the Jesuits aren't all good, don't get me wrong, but they were in some ways kind of a stabilizing influence. They kept the Mexicans from taking the Indians' land because they would, they would guard the borders of, the, of the, um, the mission and such and say, you know, you can't come here. So after the Mexican Revolution, they threw all the Jesuits out. And the Indians lost again because now there was nobody looking out for their interest who understood the, you know, the European uh, legal system and stuff. And so they'd lose their lands and they'd lose all kinds of things. And so this chaos just kept coming. And then the Americans showed up and it, it was just no end to it. And so there were waves of, of destruction throughout the hundreds of years of, since the Europeans arrived. And, and they've lost so much as far as how to make glaze paint or how to make organic paint or all these things that we look at the pots and go, wow, that's really pretty. Um, you know, and the native, and you go look at Native American pottery that's being made in the Southwest today. Beautiful work. But a lot of the technology that was lost in, say, 1400 has never been fully recovered since then. Uh, okay, let's see. Charlene has one last stupid question. Using sticks, roughly how long do you continue to add them to your fire and how can you tell the pots are done? Um, so Charlene, uh, I have a bunch of videos about firing. Basically, I add all the sticks I want at the beginning and then light it off. And I don't generally add more sticks until that's all burned down. Uh, you have the, the, the question about how to know when they're done, it's about adding enough fuel at the beginning. So if you're just getting started, lean on the side of overfueling the pottery, right? Like, oh, I might have too much fuel, but I'm not going to have not enough. So um, the only way you know if the pot's done is when you pull it out of the fire, you can you know, clink it with your fingernail and see if it rings. And if you really want to give it the test, put it in water and let it set overnight. If you come back and your pot has gone to pieces, you didn't fire it hard enough. If it's still a good pot, sound pot after holding water overnight, you've done a good job. You're just going to have to experiment with it, uh, Sherlene. That's how, that's how all of us learned. Um, you know, you can get yourself one of those little infrared guns and hit it. If you get that up to about 750 or 800 degrees Celsius, you're fine. Uh, I think you can get those for about 50 bucks. Those little infrared guns. That, that's a good investment. But, you know, you don't have to. You don't have to. Uh, Simply Pam. Hey, from St. David. You're not far away. Uh, how much hotter is coal versus wood? Uh, so, A. Duncan wants to know how hot coal is compared to wood. And, and I'd always been told from the archaeological reports that um, coal was so much better than wood. That, that the secret to the Hopi yellowware was these coal firings, which got really hot. So, I went up to Hopi last summer. I measured three different coal firings. And they were all right around 900 degrees Celsius, maybe a little more, maybe like 920 Celsius, but they never got close to 1,000 degrees Celsius. It could have to do with the coal or the, the weather or something, but they didn't get as hot as I'd expected. I can get 900 with a wood fire. I can. And not even, I don't even have to work that hard at it. So I don't know if coal's any hotter than wood uh, now that I've done that. I'd have to do some more experimenting to know for sure. But it burns longer. That coal will burn all night. You could start it at like sundown, and when you get up in the morning, it's still hot. So uh, I don't know if it's if it, it gives a real good oxidation and it burns for a long time. But I don't know if it's hotter. Perhaps if you use the right coal or if you do it the right way. I don't know. But that's my experience with coal. Uh, Chris in Kansas, I think the lifestyle aspect is interesting. In the prehistoric central Kansas region, they didn't apparently have a lot of time to doodle, let alone elaborate. Well, that's what I always say, Chris, is, is these ladies, the, the women made pottery, you know, historically in the Southwest, traditionally. And they were, you know, they were chasing around kids. They were making dinner. They were making moccasins or, or sandals. They were uh, collecting firewood. They were, uh, you know, grinding corn. They were busy, busy, busy ladies. How they had time to make beautiful decorated pottery is completely beyond me, you know. They, uh, they had a hard life, and they worked hard at it, and they still had time to make pottery. is inspiring to me. Um, and yeah, I understand. If, if, if your life is even a fraction harder than, than what it was for these ancient Pueblos, you don't have time to uh, hardly make pottery at all, let alone decorate it. I, I totally get it. Um, what do you know about pottery kill holes? Yeah, so they have these holes in the bottom of pots, and they're sometimes found in graves. And they, there's people that say that, you know, they were purposely punching this hole in. Well, it's obviously purposely because it'll be right in the bottom and it's from the outside in uh, that they were releasing the spirit or whatever. But that's all conjecture. And uh, you cannot always say that a pot with a kill hole came from a burial because they have been found not in burials too. So there's a lot we don't know. And a lot of this has to do with, like I said, that chaos, right? So the members area was depopulated and abandoned in 
eleven fifty before twelve hundred, you know, something like that. I think eleven fifty. And so at that point, members pottery, members black and white pottery ceased being made. So the you know and then we had other areas depopulated, you know, later, like thirteen eighty and fourteen fifty. So by the time Europeans came and start writing stuff down, uh, there was nobody here that I'm aware of that was doing, you know, the kill hole. So it's just a matter of conjecture. There's there's no way to know for sure, I don't think. Um, that archaeologist doing that is literally in my wheelhouse for examining studying clues. Yeah, so hopefully, um, Indigenous Pothead, hopefully uh, that'll be next month. I don't know. I'm, I'm talking to her right now um, about doing it. So hopefully next month, early next early July, I'll get her here on my live stream and, you know, we'll put two pictures. I'll be over here and she'll be over here or whatever. And, you know, and uh, she'll be in her, her uh, not it's called, called a studio, it would be a um, lab. She'll be in her lab and I'll be here in my studio. And that way she'll have access. She can show you her microscope and like, you know, what she's working on. And I think it'll be a good conversation. I think it'd be interesting. Hope that gets uploaded later. Got to go. Uh, CSCJS, West End development of native pottery was greatly influenced by diet. Example, you need a good cooking pot if you're cooking beans. Yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, they started making pottery because they were starting to do agriculture. So just because they started to grow corn meant they needed some way to store that corn where it wouldn't get eaten by the rodents. So again, that had to do with their diet, right? Because they were growing the corn. They wanted to eat the corn. They couldn't have rodents eating it before they did. Uh, and yeah, beans, you know, once you start growing beans and you have to soak those beans, you have to cook those beans over a long period. So absolutely. Like those cylinder jars that they, they find in them in Chaco Canyon and they studied the inside and found um, evidence that they were drinking chocolate out of them. Uh, you know, those cylinder jars had to do with the chocolate, whatever ceremony they were doing with it or whatever. So most unusual or most exciting pigment you've used. Is there a pigment on your bucket list? Um, pigment, exciting pigment. Uh, yeah, no, I don't know. Um, you know, I... I'm probably most excited right now about this is my lead this is my my lead so I took I bought a galena rock I went to the mine I couldn't find any galena I finally went to a rock store and bought galena I tried painting it on pottery it didn't melt I um then I read that there was evidence that the prehistoric Native Americans were pre-roasting their galena so I took this uh, can of galena you can see it got hot I burned all the paint off I, I got it real hot and I roasted it and I stirred it while it was roasting so it oxidized it then I painted it on a pot. Now I'm starting to get melted black designs on my pottery. So I'm making progress. So right now I'm excited about this. I don't know. It may not be super exciting. It is to me. <laughs> um, so yeah, great presentation. Andy says, John Rizzi. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate all of you showing up today and asking good questions. I appreciate everybody. Uh, we've been at this an hour. So uh, I sure pre Oh, would you, if you could do me a favor and, um, and hit the... Uh, Hit the like button for me. That would really help me out. I should ask that earlier, but I was busy running my mouth. So um, I really appreciate everybody, and, and like I said, all your all your great questions and everything.